Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. The President of the United States wound up in a very public brawl today with a man who was once one of his closest advisors. Steve Bannon was a senior figure in the 2016 Trump effort. And for the first several months of the administration until August, he was one of the top staffers in the White House. Now he appears to be at odds with his former boss, to put it mildly. In an upcoming book, Bannon is quoted as saying that a meeting between the Trump campaign, its officials, and a Russian lawyer back in 2016 may have been, quote, treason and unpatriotic. Well, the president responded almost immediately with a statement as pungent as it was direct. Here are a few selected passages, quote, Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Steve was a staffer who worked for me after I'd already won the nomination by defeating 17 candidates. Now that he's on his own, Steve is learning that winning is not as easy as I make it look. Steve had very little to do with our historic victory, which was delivered by the forgotten men and women of this country. Yet Steve had everything to do with the loss of a Senate seat in Alabama held for more than 30 years by Republicans. Steve does not represent my base. He's only in it for himself. We have many great Republican members of Congress and candidates who are very supportive of the Make America Great Again agenda. Like me, they love the United States of America and are helping to finally take our country back and build it up rather than simply seeking to burn it all down. Pretty amusing. And there's some truth in there for sure, but don't let that obscure the larger truth. The ideological gulf between the president and Steve Bannon is small. This is not a fight over ideas. It's a fight over who deserves credit for an election win. Talk about missing the point. The legacy of 2016 is not a single person, any person. It's a set of ideas, the ones that reflect the hopes and the needs and the fears and the aspirations of a badly mistreated American middle class. Those voters came to the polls because they wanted real borders, higher wages, dignified jobs. They were dispirited by the opioid epidemic. Why wouldn't they be? They were sick of being lectured by a political class in Washington that despises them and holds them in contempt. They revere their country, but they had come to recognize that it is hard to make the rest of the world better and very easy to make it worse. Above all, they voted for leadership that promised to put Americans first above any foreign nation or domestic interest group. That is the real legacy of 2016, that agenda. And getting it done is the central duty of this administration, regardless of who staffs it. Matt Schlapp is the chairman of the American Conservative Union, and he joins us tonight. Matt, good to see you. Good to see you, Tucker. So we had a lot of different lead segments in mind because there's a lot going on. In the there world. is. This statement kind of overtook the entire news cycle uh, here in Washington, and I'm still trying all these hours later to figure out exactly what this is about. Who is served by this argument, and what does it represent? Well, I think the only people that were happy today were the people on other cable news shows that are prosecuting the case against what, who was a legitimately elected president. Hashtag resistance and all the forces that feel a little wind uh, in their sails because of this statement from Steve Bannon, which is over the line, inappropriate, and he really should take it back because I know that he doesn't believe so which what he you, said. Which, which statement are you referring to? The idea that uh, Jared Kushner or Don Jr. are traitors or, or, or acted in a treasonous way. They're is, unpatriotic. Yeah, and, or treasonous is right. way beyond the pale, and he ought to take it back because that's, that's really not what this is about because what he said earlier is that this investigation was a canard, that there was no Russia collusion, that he saw nothing inappropriate, and I think that's where the American people who are good-natured and fair are going to come down on this whole set of questions. And this is going to be a drama that we're going to have to deal with over the next couple days, but I think it's a very unfortunate thing. So if you get uh, toward the bottom of the president's statement, very colorful uh, statement, he says this, Steve doesn't represent my base. He's only in it for himself. That seems like the nub of it here, the debate over who represents Trump's voters. Is it the president or is it his chief strategist, Steve Bannon? What's the answer? Uh, the conservative movement is not aligned to any one person, but they are head over heels overjoyed 
with the first year of the Trump presidency and the Trump agenda. They know that we could be looking at one or two additional Supreme Court openings potentially in 2018, and they know that there's going to be a huge election at the end of this year where the majority in the Senate and the House are up for grabs. And they believe, they might have been unsure about Trump in the beginning, but they're not unsure about him now, Tucker. And they don't, there's no question as to whether or not who their allegiance is with, it's who their allegiance is with. It's the leader of their party. It's the president of the United States, and it's the agenda he's pushing. And Steve Bannon is for that agenda too. So why do anything to help hashtag resistance, which is all about trying to delegitimize Trump? And I think that's where Steve made a big mistake with this, with his uh, talking to a very left-wing journalist who he shouldn't even be talking to. That journalist is not very left-wing, but by, by the way, Mike. Well, I, I, I actually, I just in point of fact, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think he is. And it wasn't you just think, in that conversation. Do you think however. that this journalist is somebody who uh, he should talk to in this manner? in order to really try to harm the Trump agenda. I don't right. think it's smart. No, no, I'm not, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying right. I, I have confidence that that journalist, Michael Wolff, is accurately representing the quote that he heard because I think he's an honest journalist. Well, that, I'm, not question, I'm not questioning and that I don't part. Think, I don't think he has an ideological agenda here. What I'm struck by is the fact that it was said in the first place by Steve Bannon, and I wonder exactly. why. Exactly. Well, that's the question. Why? What's the point of this? I think the point is, is that at, when you're a staffer at the White House, you're a staffer. By the way, he did this as a staffer. Right. You serve a president. I've served a president, right? And you don't talk to journalists, whether on the record or off the record in any way, to try to harm the agenda. If you're trying to harm the agenda, who's disloyal? But this is not the first time. I mean, it's not just well, it in doesn't matter. this, Michael. Right. No, well, but I'm just saying, in five different interviews in the past couple of months, you have seen direct attacks on Trump by Bannon or attacks that clearly came from Bannon. And I'm just wondering, what is there a point to this? Where well, is this going? I mean, you're one of the leaders of the institutional conservative movement in Washington. Right. Do you st see Steve Bannon leading part of it five years from now? I think Steve Bo Bannon is an important voice, but I think he's greatly marginalized his voice because what this looks, this looks personal, this looks petty. It's about who did the most to help Donald Trump win. It's about revision, and it helps the left. And I think activists around this country, conservative activists, see this for what it is. It's a distraction on President Trump and conservative Republicans pushing this great agenda. And anything that gets in the way of that agenda, certainly when it's about ego right. and claiming credit, is a distraction. And so I think he hurts himself unless he, unless he comes out and says, look, I might have disagreements with Jared Kushner or Donald Trump Jr., but I don't think there's anything to this investigation, because that's what all of his other public right, comments have right. said. Right, And very quickly, there have been reports that he is considering running for president in 2020. Is that true? And does he have a shot, do you think? Uh, he does not have a shot, period. And he certainly doesn't have a shot in a Republican primary. No one is going to run to the right of Donald Trump, Tucker. He has, got, he has captured that by making this commitment to conservatives with this agenda and delivering on the agenda. It's just, it's ironclad. Matt Schlapp. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Tucker. Keith Koffler has spent a lot of time thinking about Steve Bannon. He is the author of the book Bannon, Always the Rebel. Some would say the definitive biography of Stephen K. Bannon. Uh, Keith, great to see you. I would say that too. Thank I, you, Doctor. So what, what is, you know Bannon well, yes. you wrote a book about him. Right. What's the point of this? He doesn't do things, presumably, for no reason. I think that he was angry. I think that he, at the time he said that, it could have been either July or right after, because they said it was, it was soon after a July story in the New York Times. So it didn't have to be while he was still a staffer. It might have come in August, right after he left the White House, I'm not sure. Either way, he was involved in these vicious internecine uh, 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 struggles within the White House. Right. I don't think there's necessarily a point to this. I think he might roll it back if he could at this point. I doubt he will. But I, I differ a little bit on the results of this because I think that the person, you know, you know, what happened here is that the president issued a statement condemning an individual. I've covered the White House for 20 years. I've never seen that. Right. Maybe, maybe Osama bin Laden. Uh, you know, other than that, I've never seen a, a, an official presidential statement condemning an ind individual. Bannon is not going to react well to this. He probably already has had some trouble with Trump's flirtation with DACA, a DACA deal, uh, maybe even a little bit with the tax cut. The problem for Trump is this. He has basically declared war on Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon likes wars, and I think he's going to go for it. He may not come out in, you know, immediately against uh, Trump, but little by little, he may end up picking apart Trump. And the problem for Trump is, is that 
Bannon is his conduit to the base, his best conduit to the base. If he loses Bannon, he cannot afford to lose a lot of the base. He only won. The, he may think he won the popular vote, but he didn't. The base is what elected him, and he, and he needs Bannon to support him and in that. So you think that Trump voters trust Steve Bannon more than they trust Donald Trump? No, I'm not saying that. Although Bannon is a rock star among the populist voters that that elected right. Trump. What I'm saying is that if Bannon does even a little damage to Trump, which he could do, let's say Trump wins the war, if there is a war. Uh, against Bannon. If Bannon is if Bannon damages him even a little bit, Trump cannot afford that. And Breitbart News and 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 Bannon himself is the most important conduit to the base that Trump has other than Trump himself. Let's be clear, Trump is the best person for that. But look how many votes he won by, you know, uh, 60,000 votes turned in the election, he loses it. If it's another type of election like that, and he's got one of his premier spokesmen, and he's also been a spokesman for Bannon uh, for many months, against him, then, you know, Trump can have well, a so problem. So let me just, since you know his mind, let me ask you the question I asked Matt Schlapp, which is, this is clearly not an isolated occurrence of him attacking Trump. He's right. been doing this, or through, uh, in effect, cutouts, he's been doing this for months. Right. What's the point? What's he trying to get out of that? I, well, I mean, mostly he's been supportive of Trump. I mean, he, what, the people that he is angry with are the people around Trump. And, uh, you know, Ivanka Trump, right. uh, uh, Jared Kushner, who he calls Javanka, he's been doing that without severe penalty right. for quite a while now. Now, you know, and, and you can understand Trump being upset that his son is being called treasonous, of course. Um, but I think that, you know, you know, what he is trying to do is marginalize people within the White House who have a, a more establishment Republican agenda and keep Trump Trump's ear and 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 keep Trump focused on the things that he was elected on, not on his base. You know, Trump. It's family over everything. Trump loves his family. Right. But in terms of his personality and his actual political beliefs, he's actually a lot closer to Steve Bannon than he is to Ivanka Trump. It sure seems that way. Yeah. Keith Koffler, thank you. Thank you very much. Voice on this question. Well, on the left, it has suddenly, weirdly, become acceptable to attack people on the basis of their skin color. How did that happen, and what's it doing to our country? We'll tell you in sad and thorough detail next. Well, there's a basic moral principle that was for a long time conventional wisdom in this country. You probably grew up with it. It was this, people deserve to be treated as individuals, judged by their own efforts and their abilities on the things they can control. Attacking people on the basis of their race is wrong. That was the standard, and for a long time, almost everybody in America believed it or claimed to believe it. Not anymore. On the left, it's now acceptable, even encouraged, to attack and discriminate against people solely on the basis of their skin color. Now, you're not supposed to say anything about it, but suddenly it's everywhere. Consider The Root, for example. It's an online magazine owned by the media company Univision. It's not some obscure hate site lurking in the dark corners of the internet. It's considered a mainstream destination. It's got 8 million visitors a month. It's supported by huge advertisers like Toyota. Here are some recent stories The Root has published. Quote, white people need to be better people. Five life hacks for black people who want to leverage white guilt to make white people uncomfortable at work. We need a reset button or something for white people. The most useless types of white people, ranked. There are plenty more just like that. You can Google it if you want. The articles have a pretty clear intent to attack and ridicule an entire race for the crime of being born with certain genes. Now imagine a news website that tried to rank the most useless types of fill-in-the-blank people. Would you be embarrassed to read something like that? We hope you would be. Would Toyota advertise on a site that ran a piece like that? Come on, of course not. But it advertises on The Root, and The Root is not alone, not even close to alone. Take a look at BuzzFeed. It's one of the most popular websites in America. In 2016, that company was valued at $1.5 billion. That's six times what Jeff Bezos paid for The Washington Post a couple of years ago. Just last week, just last week, BuzzFeed published a piece entitled, 37 Things White People Need to Stop Ruining in 2018. One of the items on the list, America. Now, that's not just wrong, it's nuts. It's actually suicidal. As liberals are always correctly reminding us, America is a multiracial society, which is great. Um, racial societies are great, multiracial ones, but they're fragile, always. And they only survive when people of different races decide to treat each other as human beings with equal dignity. When they square off into warring tribes, it's over. Now, liberals say they abhor white nationalism, and they should, but at the same time, they're promoting it with crap like this. 
when rich people, liberals pull up BuzzFeed for the latest listicle on why white people are wrecking America or whatever, they're happy to laugh along because they're safe in the knowledge it doesn't actually threaten them. But the joke looks a lot different when you're not rich. Imagine you're a machinist on disability in Akron. You've lost family and friends to heroin. You haven't painted your house in 20 years. Everybody you know is being crushed by the rising cost of education and health care. You're fairly certain your kids are going to make even less than you do, assuming jobs will even exist when the robots get here. You're worried, and you should be. And now some smug private school kid from Brooklyn is lecturing you about how you're the problem because of the color of your skin and the privilege it conveys. How much of that are you going to take before you explode at the unfairness of it all? And at that point, why wouldn't you embrace a racial identity? Everybody else seems to be doing it. That's a disaster, and it's not theoretical, by the way. That's what's going to happen in this country unless people start deciding they're going to treat one another as individuals rather than as members of groups. Jason Nichols is a professor of Af African American Studies at the University of Maryland, and he joins us now. Professor, thanks for coming on. Thank you. So my concern here is that pieces like this, attitudes like this, which are ubiquitous on the affluent left, the privileged left, are driving the country apart along racial lines to an even greater extent than we are already divided by racial lines, and that you're going to wind up with a totally balkanized society. I don't know why people would do this, and I don't know when it became okay to do this. Okay, so when we talk about what drives us apart yeah. as a society, let's talk about the fact that black people are three times more likely to be denied for a home loan, that you have a better chance of getting employment with a high school diploma than I do with a, a college degree. Uh, let's talk about uh, many other structural issues that sure. we have. Happy, that, happy to, but, but you're not answering apart. my question, which is why does this help? I mean, we've always been divided along racial lines. It's a tragedy. It's one of the worst things, it's the worst thing about America. And you don't want it to get worse, which uh -huh. is why you don't attack I, people on the basis of their race in public. And now all of a sudden the left has decided that's okay. I, this I, seems crazy I, to I, me. Well, see, again, you know, you have to enter in nuance and context here. I think that many of these articles that you brought up are actually lampooning the ridiculousness and absurdity of racism itself. They're trying to turn racism on its head and say, look, if white, you know, white people do these things, this is absurd. So, and again, in, in a society where white people, so I know you don't joke? like. I think it's it's a, a well, if satire. It's, if it's, it's a satire, satire, then but you know that nobody. Had, I mean, if you were at BuzzFeed and you said, "I've got an idea for a piece," how about thirty-seven reasons Mexicans are wrecking America? You'd be canned. You'd be in, you'd be in it HR be. at very least. Okay. You should be. So why is it okay to say that about another race? If if we really believe that it's wrong to attack people on the basis of their race. Why isn't it wrong to attack people on the basis of their race? Because if you put out this article, one of those articles, uh, of, and black people or Mexican people or whomever said that about white people, let's say 80% of the black outlets and, and Latino outlets said these things about white people, it would not affect white people in terms of their socioeconomic status, their health outcomes, their housing, their education, or incarceration. None of that would be know, affected. But, but you're, so you're that, basically, okay, but you're living in a world. consequences. You're though. living in a world that doesn't exist anymore. You're living in a world where all the rich people are white and all the poor people are non-white. In modern America, the one group of Americans whose life expectancy is declining is working class white people. I'm not whining about okay. this on racial lines. I'm just saying, if you're one of those people, you're saying, why are you attacking me? I don't have any privilege. Why are you doing this to me? And you're pushing, stuff like this pushes okay. people to be more racially conscious, which is bad, in my opinion, if you see what so, I'm saying. So again, I think, if we want to talk about the way people experience poverty, right. I think, first of all, uh, it's been proven that a black person who makes $100,000 yeah. is actually uh, going to live in a poor neighborhood with fewer resources than a white person okay, who makes I'm, less that than $25,000. That may be true. Look, I'm not... There, no, white I'm sure poverty that, and black that, poverty are not equivalent. I be, okay, but I'm just saying... The life expectancy of working class white people is in decline. That's true for no other group. Absolutely. I'm not saying they have the toughest road to hoe. I'm just saying it's bad, actually. No, no, we and, all know and, that. And so I would agree why with you. are yeah. 
pr rich private school hipster, hipsters from freaking <laughs> Brooklyn attacking them like they're all I, living in Palm Beach. Like, I, why well, wouldn't that stir resentment? I, I looked at some of those BuzzFeed articles, and certainly I've looked at the Root articles, and for the most part, they are attacking the wealthy people that move people out of Brooklyn, not the working class person okay. in, in Alabama. But you can see why. You know, look, I you think can we, see, we see why this would lead to resentment. We don't need any more resentment in America from Absolutely anybody, not. I would think. Absolutely not. But can't, how about, let's just make it super simple and just say, probably a bad idea to make generalizations about people based on their skin color because it's not the most important thing about people, actually. And, and again, I, again, I think you need to look at these articles. I have. Where in many cases, it's not just about race, the, you know, class is in there as well. And again, if you're looking at it, uh, you know, intelligently and with nuance, you will see that they're actually lampooning racism. They're trying yeah, to say how not, ridiculous not, racism no, is. Not. This isn't, they're attacking not talking a group. about white You're people. seeing this, of course they are, because you can't say it about any other group as you know. There's only one group you can attack. I, I hate even to say this out loud, because it sounds like whining, and I hate whining. I just honestly think you're pushing a whole group of people to become way more racially conscious, and I don't want to live in a country where everyone primarily identifies by race. Do you? No, well, you don't. I, well, first you of don't. all, we live in a country where uh, race and race consciousness is forced upon all but of us. But you don't want more of it, do you? And, and I don't think that these articles are, are doing that. I think they are trying to show how absurd racism is. That's the whole point. But only white racism, as if that's the only kind, and that's just, that's not true. That's, that's the only kind that has systemic uh, uh, consequences on people. Boy, that, I mean, I'm telling you, it's just not fair to say to someone who lives in the middle of the country, whose economic prospects have been devastated, who really doesn't have much of a future, you're part of the problem, really? Like, in what world is that person part oppressing and, anybody? Yeah, like, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I honestly don't think that most of those articles are saying that about that person who's in the middle of the country, who is suffering economically. It just seems most like people, another example of the powerful mocking the weak in order to feel virtuous. And, and I don't and think I hate that, that. Well, first of all, I, I, would, I would disagree that some you know, writer or staff writer or, or uh, you know, contract writer for the BuzzFeed represents the powerful. That guy's making yes, forty thousand dollars a yeah. year. Name name one who went to public school in the Midwest. <laughs> I bet you can. Anyway, we're out of time. Congressman, thank you. Rather, Congressman. Uh, well, maybe in the future. I hope you'll announce on this show, <laughs> Professor. Good to see you. Chadwick Absolutely. Moore is thank a you. journalist in New York City. Uh, home of Brooklyn and people who write for BuzzFeed and he joins us tonight. Chadwick, I, I know I'm painting with a broad brush here, but I can kind of picture the staffer in question sneering at the middle of the country and maligning an entire group based on their skin color, which I thought was not allowed. Right. Yeah, I don't believe your guest for one second when he thinks, your former guest, when he says he thinks that these, these articles are meant to be satire, make fun of racism. No, 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 no. It, it's exactly, I think, how you painted it. These sort of uh, liberal Oberlin kids who graduated and live in Brooklyn and, and for some reason want to uh, believe in this sort of dismantle the wealth narrative. And they think the way to do that is to attack white people. I mean, it's, it's Marxism. It's socialism. And it has the mainstream media's ear. It has mainstream society's ear. Uh, when you see these people who, who obsess over victimhood so much, it's so fascinating because if, if you want to see racism everywhere, if you're brainwashed to see racism everywhere or homophobia everywhere or whatever, then you will. That's the world you will live in. You know, I was having a conversation with, uh, with a woman uh, not too long ago about this, a, a young upper middle class black woman. And she was talking about how badly she you know, gets treated on the street here in New York. And I said to her, what if you lived for one day as a white woman and you were treated the exact same way? People were just as rude to you. What then? Yeah. It uh, doesn't make anybody happier to see everything through that lens. Um, yeah. So let me ask you about something that happened yesterday on The View. I personally missed it, but I've seen the tape. Maybe you saw co-host Joy Behar reacted to the ongoing protests we've been seeing in Iran by saying the U.S. is on the very brink of executing gay people in the streets. Watch this. It's not apples and apples. It's not equal. But we're on a very slippery slope, slope in this country toward throwing democracy out the window well, every the single day. We have to defend the freedom of the press and civil rights here. We do, but and, we're not being you know, stoned in the street for being gay. Not yet. Not yet. They're completely... not yet. Now, how close do you think we are to a country where people are stoned in the streets for being gay, as Joy Behar suggests. Look, you know, I have to tell people this all the time. We can't even get funding for the wall, so the gay death camps are definitely not happening till the second term. 
I mean, we really have some time to battle this. She's, she's completely ridiculous. This narrative that they want to push is so absurd. There's no proof to it. It's total, it's just it's such a load of bull. Uh, I don't know, in, the, in that same discussion, she was uh, sort of ironically saying that the, that the protesters in Iran and uh, the, the so-called women's marchers here, these resist uh, protesters, she called them protesters, uh, are, are basically fighting for the same thing. And she said, well, you know, the, the, the details are different about uh, what, what they're, they're fighting against. Uh, but the, uh, the general thing, that they want democracy and freedom, and ours is deeply under attack in this country. All right, well, firstly, let's talk about that. In Iran, you have women tearing off their headscarves and in their hijabs. And here in New York and in Washington, you have women and men, liberal men, putting them on as a symbol of liberation. Of course. Uh, and when she says, it, yeah, it, it, it's so funny to see her saying our democracy is under attack. But it's First also, I mean, it's such a grotesque overstatement. And I know what it's like to get mad on television, but part of your brain says, you know, pull back a little bit. You know, don't say more than you mean. Don't overstate things grotesquely, because if you do, you're going to be called on it. And you shouldn't say things that aren't true. No one ever calls anybody on the left when they say like, ludicrous things like gays are about to be stoned in the streets. What? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's it's just this hysteria, and they they have no evidence for it. They have absolutely no evidence for it, and uh, it's it's exactly they're just showing who they are. They have no argument. Uh, yeah, it's childish. Know, yeah, it's very childish. Chadwick Moore, great to see you. All right, thank you, Tucker. Thanks. Well, congressional investigators say they have found evidence the FBI rigged its investigation of Hillary Clinton. You don't want to believe that. A former FBI official joins us next. He has an informed view of that. Stay tuned. Congressional investigators said they have found troubling irregularities in the FBI's investigation of Hillary Clinton and her email server. According to a report in The Hill, FBI agents had their investigation micromanaged by higher level officials in contrast to ordinary practice. You know what that means. The investigators also told The Hill they found evidence the FBI began drafting an exoneration of Hillary Clinton before it had even gathered all the relevant evidence or interviewed more than a dozen key witnesses. Chris Swecker is a former assistant director of the FBI, and he joins us tonight. Mr. Swecker, thanks for coming on. Evening, Tucker. So you've seen this report. I don't think anybody, any American, wants to believe the FBI is not on the level or subject to political manipulation. But that's a conclusion I'm reluctantly reaching. What's your conclusion? Well, as an experienced investigator, it doesn't take a congressional investigation to tell me that nothing about that investigation was right. I mean, we, th those of us that have conducted federal criminal investigations know that you use the grand jury, you use search warrants, you don't hand out immunities like candy. I mean, everything in that investigation runs contrary to the way uh, a real, credible, thorough FBI investigation is conducted. So give us, as, as you're watching this, give us the specific examples that tipped you off that this was, this was not unfolding as it ought to have been. Well, first and foremost, in any complicated federal investigation, the basic tool of the trade is a grand jury. Right. And use of the grand jury to obtain records. You don't, you don't go to witnesses and say, Mother, may I have that computer hard drive? May I have those emails? You use subpoenas and process and grand jury and search warrants and that sort of process. Um, so that was the tip off from the beginning. So many deals were made with people not knowing what kind of information they had. And the, the deal's being made simply because they lawyered up and, and didn't want to talk to FBI agents. That's when you throw them in front of a grand jury. Well, exactly, because no, I mean, of course, a, a lot of subjects, most subjects, I would think, lawyer up, and nobody wants to talk to the FBI, of course. But the FBI doesn't normally cave to that, does it? No. Uh, you, you look at uh, when, when Jim Comey was the deputy attorney general running the corporate fraud task force, and I was running the criminal division. I mean, we, were, we played hardball in those investigations. You, you, you used grand jury process. You didn't just ask for records, and you didn't give them an opportunity to hand over what they wanted to hand over. And if they did lawyer up, you went to the trouble of throwing them in front of a grand jury to put their, their statement on the record, or they can take the fifth, and then you can make a decision as to whether to grant them immunity at that time. But the, not, none of that was done in this case. Why, this was why? like driving a car with the brakes on. What, why wasn't it done, do you think? You know, that's what puzzles uh, myself and all of my former colleagues, uh, people who have retired from the FBI, from, from executive level positions on down to the street level. Uh, the only thing I can, I can uh, come up with is that uh, Director Comey placed the investigation in the hands of his inner circle. 
and they they had their own agenda, obviously. I mean, we've seen that from some of the uh, some of the information that has since come out, the texts, et cetera. So you think it was political? I think that there were people inside that inner circle, in the Comey inner circle, that had their own predetermined opinions about uh, the Trump. Uh, I mean, excuse me, about uh, Hillary Clinton and the president, or the, what, yes. what then was a, 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 a president-elect or someone running for president. So let me, let me ask you about something that I found really striking. Tell me if you, you had the same reaction. So we, we now have documents that came out in a lawsuit um, that show internal documents from the FBI that when the then Attorney General Loretta Lynch had that famous meeting on the tarmac with Bill Clinton, his wife is being investigated at the time. The FBI's first reaction was not to figure out how did that happen. The first reaction was to find out how news of it leaked. That seemed like a very weird reaction to me. It's not the FBI that I know, and my as I said, my former colleagues that I compare notes notes with all the time. That's not how things were handled. And then uh, former director Comey, Comey's uh, rationale, shall we say, uh, for making this prosecutive decision that the FBI director has has no business making, uh, that she was not that he was that she was not to be prosecuted, um, that that was based on that that tarmac meeting. Well, if that were the case, all he had to do was hand the investigation to the attorney general's office, let her recuse herself from that making that decision, knock it down to her number two level person. And then if that didn't happen, then maybe raise the issue publicly. It's really distressing to watch this. Thank you for your perspective on that. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, in order to get the federal government funded, Democrats are demanding that DACA recipients be given amnesty. They may try to shut down the government if they don't get it. That story next. With each passing day, the possibility grows that DACA will force a shutdown of the federal government because, of course, legalizing people who are here illegally is the single most important thing our government can do. President Trump says amnesty for DACA beneficiaries is a possibility, but it needs to be tied to long-term immigration reform provisions like a border wall and an end to chain migration, abolition of the diversity lottery, etc. Democrats argue there should be no concessions in return for amnesty. Some are willing to shut down the government during budget negotiations to get their way. One who is willing to compromise, still a Democrat, though, is Congressman John Garamendi of California, and he joins us tonight. Congressman, thanks for coming on. Good evening, Tucker, and a happy new year to you. A happy and new year. All the rest of the world. Yeah, so, exactly. uh, this is one of those rare negotiations where one side has already said, yeah. I'm willing to compromise. The president has said, look, I'm, I'm willing to support legalization, yeah. amnesty for these mm -hmm. people here legally. But you got to reassure mm -hmm. us that they're not going to bring all their relatives with them and that sure. we're going to be able to prevent people like them from coming in the future with like real border security, like a wall. Why would Democrats be against that? Well, certainly the Democrats are, do not want the government to shut down, period. That's our positions. Right. We've held that position uh, in the past, and frankly, we were not responsible for the shutdowns of the past. However, going forward, what are we to do? Uh, we did, uh, we did, or the Republicans put a uh, 1. 150-some billion dollar hole in the money that we need to fund all government programs for the next year. That was the tax cut that we just passed last right. December. And so we start off with a very, very difficult financial situation in which $150 billion that we were counting on to solve some of the uh, financial issues, some of the funding problems, uh, disappeared in that tax cut. Well, I think that's, so a, I mean, that's a fair problem. thing to, no, but I, I actually would, would agree with you on that. I mean, that's a kind of legitimate argument to have. Do we have enough money? Where so do we get the money? But why are we having an argument about people who aren't even citizens? I mean, I, I feel sorry for them, well, but that's like, that's like number 111 on the list of priorities for most Americans. Why is it number one for Democrats? Well, well, unless you happen to be one of the 800 or 800,000 that are DACA, that of which 160,000 have actually graduated from one or another of our no, universities. I mean, they're, they're great, but like I mean, they're also, there are 325 million actual Americans here, and their concerns sure. are going down the list, yeah. so the concerns of illegal aliens well, can take the top spot. Why? Well, there's also a host of other problems that are in that uh, funding question in the keeping the government open. 
Uh, the military wants more money and frankly yeah. needs more money. Uh, we also need to provide money for the children's health insurance programs uh, and on and on. So uh, infrastructure, anybody mentioned the uh, trillion dollar infrastructure and where's the money for that? Well, it mostly disappeared in the tax cut. Uh, look, so I'm, not how do we I'm not disagreeing these things with forward? you, so, but why can't, look, look, can we just get past the DACA thing? We're just spending okay. an awful lot of time I think we will. on other, well, other country citizens when our yeah. citizens are waiting for Congress to do something. So why not just say, look, that's fine. We will build a wall. Why not build a wall? What, it'll put Americans well, to work. Why not say you, you can't bring, sneak in and then bring your relatives? What? You sneak in, then your relatives? Get well, to come. I, like, why is that fair? Well, I think that there is a reasonable solution to all of this. Uh, the DREAM Act, which, was, uh, which has been around five years now, deals with most of that issue. Uh, the chain migration issue that uh, you talked about, or chain, chain immigration issue, uh, that needs to be addressed. It can be uh, a, a serious problem. Uh, certainly these uh, DACA students are, or DACA individuals, I think are more interested in them in their own circumstances. Uh, the issue of their parents or relatives and so forth, yes, that should be dealt with. Uh, going beyond that, a, a wall, it's been pretty well determined that there are far better ways to spend several tens of billions of dollars than to build a wall. Well, how about uh, certainly this? we can use new technology. The Coast Guard, for example, needs money to patrol the oceans, which happen to be the major totally, way in which drugs enter the nation. I think most people would be nation. totally for that. But uh, under our current Good. system, we give yep. out, in effect, green cards, which become citizenship on the basis of a lottery, the diversity lottery. Why in the world, if citizenship mattered, if, our, if, our, if we cared about our country, would we just randomly yep. give green cards to people on the basis of chance, of bingo? Like, why do we have that program? Why can't we get rid of it? Well. There certainly needs to be comprehensive immigration reform, and that needs to be one of the pieces of that. Border security, absolutely essential. How do you spend the money uh, for border security? A wall, is that the best way? Many of us think that is not the best way. We also need to deal with the uh, agricultural guest worker program, uh, which is a major problem here in California. But do you uh, think that Democrats, many... sure, yeah, I know your growers want as yeah. cheap labor as they can get. I'd, I'd like cheap labor at my house too. But can we just <laughs> cheap... agree that we should stop letting people in randomly under the diversity lottery? And it's not fair to let illegal aliens bring all their relatives. I mean. Can, can we agree on those two things? I think we can. So let's write a law. <laughs> well, good. Let's get, then let's you get should have no problem getting the government funded. <laughs> good luck. Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate it. You got it. Thank you. Iran has been racked by anti-government protests. The American media seem weirdly unenthusiastic about them. Is that our imagination? Or are they trying to hide something? What is it? Very confusing. Molly Hemingway will sort it out next. There has been a wave of protests in Iran against the authoritarian government there. Americans are, of course, freedom-loving people, so surely you'd think our press would be excited to see these protests in progress. Doesn't seem so for some reason. The past couple of days, the impulse of the press has seemed to be to downplay or even criticize those protests. NBC, ABC, CBS all minimized the scale of them. An article on CNN's website highlighted pro-government counter-protests made in response to what it called, quote, rare anti-government protests. The New York Times tweeted that the protesters had, quote, ignored calls for calm from Iran's president. Are we imagining this? There's something weird going on here. Molly Hemingway is a senior editor at The Federalist. She's thought a lot about this and watched carefully. She joins us tonight. What is this about, Molly? Well, I think there are some good reasons why you're not seeing a lot of coverage and then a lot of bad reasons. Okay. The good reasons is that uh, the good reason is that Iran is a very oppressive regime. They kidnap foreign tourists. They do not have a free press. We don't have good lines of communication. It's right. very difficult to cover what's happening there. And there are a lot of bad reasons why you're not seeing a lot of coverage. And that could be everything from how this these waves of protests completely undercut the narrative that we heard throughout the Obama administration. And I think that our media tend to want to protect and defend how, President How would these Obama. protests undercut that well, storyline? President Obama and his administration kind of subverted everything to their goal of getting an Iran nuclear deal. They right. placed their bets with these mullahs who they pitched as very moderate and who they, uh, you know, they made this massive deal with. And they used people in the media to help sell this deal. And when we see these protests, it's very different from what we were told. We were just told by the New York Times very recently that Iran was a very unified country. They were unified by, by, behind their regime, that 
they were united in their opposition to Donald Trump. Well, obviously that's not true when you look at these protests, however big they are, that there is at least some coalition of people who are extremely upset with their regime and their corruption of the regime and the economic consequences of that. Some of the signs talk about how they don't like that they're involved in all these foreign conflicts and how they are, uh, you know, supporting terror in the region. That's completely different than what we've been told, and I don't think journalists like to come clean when they are shown not to be telling. Could it also be that it's far away and complicated? <laughs> and that it's much easier to write about some stupid lunch carter page whatever or some 26 year old fake foreign policy advisor had during the camp. This, the Russian nonsense maybe is closer to the heart of most journalists. Yes, and that's why it's actually so frustrating to read the New York Times coverage, because so many bureaus aren't even, so many people have just dropped foreign bureaus, or they don't have good resources in these regions. And it is very difficult to cover when you don't have people you know, on the ground. Um, but the New York Times does, and a lot of what they've been publishing has been sort of very friendly to the regime and, and parroting the regime's lines. Now, part of that might be that they're afraid that they're reporting resources there are vulnerable, right. but you shouldn't subvert journalism to share propaganda. Iran seems like the one country in the region whose population is pro-American or potentially pro-American and kind of reasonable and, and it is not really represented by its regime at all. It's sort of weird that American journalists wouldn't be more sympathetic to the population of the country yearning for a new government. Right. When, particularly a few years ago, many people in our media were so excited by Arab Spring, uh, by revolutions that they saw where even in some of those cases you were getting rid of bad leaders and replacing it with even right. worse leaders. Well, in this case, there's no question that Iran is a completely oppressive country and that it's doing a lot of bad in the region. And there are people there who are very frustrated and, and should be, at least you should you should see some sort of vocal support or coverage of what they're trying to accomplish. I mean, they are, uh, these are very brave people. Their chances are not very good of actually achieving revolution, yes. um, not just because of the military there, but the secret police and all these other resources that the regime there has. And, uh, you know, they're doing pretty impressive work. It does seem like a lot of the countries um, we saw sort of become more democratic for about 20 minutes during the Arab Spring were not ready for self-government. Iran seems a lot closer to being ready. It seems to have a much more impressive population, if I could be blunt, than some of those other countries. What a shame that we're not helping more. And it has more of a history and, it ha I mean, it, it, it has been a great empire. Yeah. And it has different... Only for 3,000 years, not a big deal. <laughs> Uh, Molly Hemingway, thank you. Thanks. Californians can't ban guns. The government there can't, so they're doing their next best thing. They're basically taking away ammunition to disarm the population. That grim story next. A lot of new laws taking effect in California this week. One of them prevents anyone from buying ammunition in the state from doing so freely. Now you have to pass a government background check and pay a fee. This goes for all ammo, AK-47 ammo, as well as relatively harmless stuff like 20-gauge birdshot or 22 long rifle. All of it, you got a permit and a background check to buy it. You also can't privately bring ammunition into the state anymore either. That is now a crime. Now, for a day, dozens of stores were outright banned from selling any ammunition at all because California's government was behind on granting permits. Surprise, surprise. Will any of this make California safer? Of course not. Criminals will ignore the law. They always do. The real and only and indeed the intended effect will be to disarm the law-abiding population. Now, keep in mind, at the same time, that same state has declared itself a legal sanctuary for foreigners who are breaking our most basic laws. So the non-threatening activity of American citizens is criminalized and law-breaking of foreigners is protected. The message, normal people are no longer welcome in the state of California. Should it surprise anybody that they are fleeing? No, it shouldn't. Sad story. That's about it for us tonight. Tune in every night at 8 p.m. to the show that's the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and groupthink. DVR it if you can figure out how that works. But above all, have a great night. Hannity is next.